This is Lynn Fraser with the Radical Recovery Summit with the Killaby Center. Today I have Dr. Jamie Merritt here and she's going to talk about the work that she does with trauma and EMDR and how that underlies addiction. She's written an excellent book called Trauma and the 12 Steps, which I'll be asking her some questions about as well. So Jamie, if you would like to go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Jamie Marich. I am the author of the book Trauma and the 12 Steps and several other books connected to this wider field of holistic recovery from addiction in a trauma-focused way. And I'm also proudly a woman in long-term recovery. And I'm very glad to be here on this summit. Well, thank you, Jamie. It's really great to have you here. So I'll just give a shout out to Dr. Stephen Danziger, Director of Recovery, who was part of our September summit. And he was the one who connected us, so that was great. Yeah, Steve is is a dear friend, and he's now a collaborator and co-author. Our new book, uh, EMDR Therapy and Trauma-Focused Care, is out this month with Springer Publishing. And uh, yeah, it represents kind of the fruit of a four or five-year collaboration we've had, or friendship we've had, that led to collaboration. Mm -hmm. And we actually met through my work on trauma and the 12 steps. He... um, was one of my readers and the work resonated with him well enough to send me an email and there was something about the first email that said I think I'm going to like this guy (laughs) right away because I knew I couldn't have been the only one in the addiction treatment field who was also a 12-stepper that felt Mm -hmm. the way I felt in that book so um, he's one of many people who I've connected with through that work. Oh that's excellent yeah I really enjoyed doing the interview with him. He has a very deep understanding of trauma and how it works. And yeah. Very much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I noticed in your TED talk was you talked about um, we are stuck individually and as a society because yes. unhealed trauma keeps us that way. Why are some people more affected by trauma and addiction is what we're going to get to kind of focusing on. But could you speak more generally to that at the beginning? What do you mean by that? So stuck. Stuck is a great layperson's term to use when we're talking about trauma, because I think a lot of us can resonate with what it means to be stuck. Uh, And it's something that comes in degrees. Sometimes we can feel stuck in one area of our life, yet thriving and flowing in other areas of our life. And usually why we're stuck, if we're using that real generalist term, is because no one has ever helped us to get unstuck on that issue. Or in the case of trauma, the fact that we're stuck may never get validated in the first place. Like, you're not stuck. You know, the, the, the drain's working fine. Why are you complaining when here it's, it's backed up? And that whole metaphor of the drain and the stuck drain really does translate well to this phenomenon of what happens in the limbic brain, which is that central part of the, the brain um, in the human experience. And the limbic brain really is designed to be a filter for the human experience. It, it lets us know when we're in danger or when we're safe. And during times of traumatic experience, um, things can get jammed in that filter, that panic button can get pressed for good reasons. But for people who stay stuck in traumatic experience, it's because it never got unstuck. Nobody ever helped them set the reset valve. And I'm using very kind of metaphoric language here on a very complicated process. And for a lot of us who are in this state of stuck for whatever reason, um, addictive substances or pleasurable activities can be introduced to us at a very vulnerable time that at least makes us feel better. Um, Because so much of that limbic brain is also responsible for these phenomena of pain and pleasure. And I always say when I do lectures, the worst thing you can tell an addict is what were you thinking if they relapsed? Because thinking had nothing to do with it, a completely different brain. That so much of what the addiction response is about are in fact survival or I feel horribly and I need to feel better. And many of us are never shown another way. Um, especially when early childhood trauma is the issue. So let's let's go right into that. So early yeah. childhood trauma, some people think um, really dramatic events must have yeah. happened. Can you talk about what trauma is and how it affects us? Right. So you referenced my TEDx talk, and people can go to that if they want even more of my spiel, my shtick on this, because anybody who's been to a course with me knows I start here that if we're having a conversation about trauma, let's look at the word origin. Trauma comes from the Greek meaning wound. 
And you're exactly right that for so many of us, even in the field, the association tends to be PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And although even the current diagnostic guidelines have expanded what can qualify for post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of people are still in that old school thinking that it has to be a combat experience or a natural disaster or some kind of life-threatening event. Um, and if we think of this idea of trauma as wound, yes, some wounds, some injuries are life-threatening. Some demand immediate care, or they could potentially be fatal. But a lot of wounds are seemingly innocuous on the surface. They can look like something like a scrape or a bite or uh, you know, a minor cut. But if they're not treated, they can infect. They can be prone to be open to further injury, especially if the individual is not constitutionally very healthy to start with. If you continue to bleed and bleed and bleed, you can put others at risk. I know in the addiction field, we're familiar with that axiom that hurt people hurt people. Uh, that is literally what happens when our wounds bleed onto other people. And we've gotten savvy to that in physical health care, right? That we have to take universal best precautions to prevent the spread of blood and pathogens and all of that. Yet so many people are walking around in the recovery field, let alone our patients we treat with unhealed wounds and unhealed traumas. And we end up doing a lot of damage to each other. So I think what is core is understanding this idea that trauma is wound. And whether you're dealing with a gunshot wound or a scrape, treatment is required. And a scrape may not require professional treatment, but it may require it gets washed out, it gets a Band-Aid put on it, and it's given time. And if it doesn't get that, further problems can continue to, to go on and on and on. So I use that, I think, as a useful metaphor to show that, yes, not all traumas may necessarily have that implication of I need to get into professional treatment right away. But if you understand this idea of trauma as wound, hopefully you can get this idea that if a wound goes untreated or unhealed, one way or another, it'll continue to cause problems. In childhood, when we're talking about the kind of wounds that carry through and carry on into adult life, mm -hmm. what are some examples um, that you might be looking at? Obviously, there's, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse, those sure. kinds of things. Um, what else? How does that? Yeah. Well, Anything connected to invalidation, whether it comes in the form of emotional neglect, whether it comes in the form of growing up in the alcoholic home, I think is the ultimate traumatic experience or the addicted home, especially if you remember those old school three rules of the alcoholic home, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. I mean, it's brilliant teaching because it's exactly right. And all three of those are antithetical or counterproductive to trauma being processed. Because typically what you need to do to heal from a wound is, if not necessarily talk, to at least have it validated. Right. Uh, you know, some kind of relational connection or trust and then feeling. I mean, I think feeling is pretty much a universal requisite here when it comes to healing wounds. So just the fact that those three conditions are not present in the alcoholic home, I think makes it a, a very pertinent example. Um, other examples would include growing up with an absent parent, an incarcerated parent, and that's not to um, you know, say like all divorces and with traumatic kids, because I think if or traumatized kids, because I think if it's handled right, it doesn't have to be that way. But yeah, if a parent remains absent, if a parent conveys in any way that a child's not wanted, those are all, um, or on the other hand, if a parent um, kind of has an overachievement mindset with, with their child, that can also lead to um, some long-term injury. Well, what's coming up for me as I'm listening to you talk is that I didn't grow up in an alcoholic home, but the same rules were there. Oh yeah. Right. And so you don't have to have alcohol in the home. Glad you brought that up. Um, you don't have to have an absent yeah. parent even. Like sometimes the parent is absent emotionally. Yeah. There's there. a exactly. And there's a peer of mine in recovery who will introduce herself as I'm a child of dysfunction. Uh, which I really like because a lot of us have the ACOA or the adult child of alcoholic badge, but she identifies as well that a lot of the same patterns apply um, even when you're dealing with other forms of unhealth in the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you're working with people yep. um, and you're giving, I'm assuming that you're, you're talking to people about what trauma is, you're giving them this kind of basic education. Yep. 
So you talked about validation. So how does yes. that work with people you work with? And just generally speaking, when you're talking about trauma and recovery? I just have seen for a lot of people having it claimed as traumatic is is one of the first big steps in the healing process. Kind of like we have said with traditional 12 step work, uh, you, you know, the first step or the requisite step is admitting there's a problem there, admitting your powerlessness, however you want to look at it. Mm-hmm. I think for a lot of folks for trauma recovery, one of the first major steps in the healing process, it's not so much I mean, it could be admitting that you've been injured or admitting that there's a trauma, but for so many of us, trauma has been compounded by the fact that others have told us it's no big deal. You should be over that or maybe not being allowed to speak of it. So to hear someone else validate, no, this is a wound. This is an injury. Um, I've just seen so much power to that. I've experienced it personally in my life and I've seen other clients and friends really benefit from that power of relational validation. It's like there's you know, there's a power in, in unshrouding what's been secreted, what's been left in the dark. Yeah, that's my experience too. And a lot of times people will say, well, I didn't really have any trauma. But then when you start to ask them questions. Oh yeah, that that's kind of a, a, a gallows humor joke around, you know, some of my colleagues and friends who work together in trauma that we've all done assessments multiple times over of people who come in saying things like, oh, I had a beautiful childhood. I had a wonderful parent or wonderful parents and we all loved each other. And it's like, whenever you hear it that quickly, that immediately, hmm, you know, my, my bells and whistles go off. Cause I think a, a tactic that a lot of dysfunctional slash abusive homes will use is to let kids really know, well, you don't know how good you have it. There are other people out there who have it so much worse, and it, it could make the individual feel that if I go to speak up, I'm being selfish or greedy or um, dramatic or something of that nature. So, yeah, it's 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 well known that that's a thing. What what you mentioned there, right? Well, and there's a something else that happens too is that the children tend to turn it back on themselves and believe there's something wrong with themselves. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Well stated. Yeah. So, so when you are working with um, the, when you're working with somebody and they're they're beginning to understand that they've been traumatized, mm-hmm. they're beginning to understand some of the mechanisms that they're using to keep themselves safe or to keep themselves from experiencing all that pain. Mm-hmm. So so often people just don't feel like that's a possibility. They they shy away from it. I mean that's the root of addiction. We're we're trying to not feel that pain. Right. So what are some of the steps that you use with people so that they can come to believe that it's safe enough for them to go into what it is that's underneath the addiction? Yeah. Well, I think, and I'm really glad to hear you use the phrase safe enough. Because I think too often we think of safety as an all or nothing thing. Mm -hmm. That a person has to feel totally safe to begin to go there and there's a lot of trauma survivors who I don't think can ever state I'm a hundred percent safe, but will feel safe enough Mm -hmm. to um, begin to engage. Um, I mean, I think like, like many elements of holistic healing, it is a multi-tiered approach and I could explain to you some of what I try to do and foster in each of the tiers and layers with the recognition that for some people, it, it may be the talking that really works right away, just having somebody hear and witness your story. But even in that, I, I would argue it's more of the relational connection yeah. that is what's healing right away. So having somebody witness for you non judgmentally, that whole idea of ministry of presence that Henri Nouwen and several others have written about, even in larger pastoral care. Uh, and, I, and even when I talk about the healing power of relationship, a teaching point I often make is if you're a pet person, if you have a dog or a cat, you may hear my cat meowing intermittently. She's trying to poke her head in here. Um, that is a healing relationship because our mammalian friends have limbic brains, just as we do. And and any relationship, I think, that is of the healthier variety can fundamentally be, be very healing. And I think that's something for all its flaws that I've written about that AA did tap into. Um, in its genesis is the healing power of one person who survived the storm helping another. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's just something about that. And and to keep an open mind that healing relationships could come in a variety of forms. It could be sponsored a 
to uh, sponsee. It could be patient to, to client or, or um, patient to clinician. Uh, one of the newer healing relationships in my life in the last year has been my martial arts coach. I've started training in uh, Gracie Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And just the things that I've not only learned from this individual, but how much trust I've been willing to give him because he's validated. Because um, other times I've had experiences in yoga or martial arts classes, um, I, I could tell which teachers I could go there with and which ones I can't. And usually it is that spirit of non-judgment, uh, willingness to listen to me, willingness to see me as a person right. as opposed to just a student. So I think healing relationships um, for a lot of people, that is often the gateway. If not the gateway, then it's definitely one of the layers. Um, another tier here, another layer of this to feeling safe enough is to have some kind of embodied experience that things can be different. Mm -hmm. uh, Bessel van der Kolk, who's kind of the, the grand psychiatric voice of trauma in the modern era that many of us cite, and, uh, something he has said that I really like is for a person to truly recover from a traumatic experience, they need to learn that the danger of the trauma has passed at the level of their body. That, of course, is not all or nothing. That could come in degrees. But when people can do things like take that first deep breath that doesn't freak them out, or maybe take a brisk walk around the building and sense into how good that feels in the body, mm -hmm. maybe hear the birds for the first time outside in a new way, or pet the dog or the cat and feel just that little semblance that something is different in the body, that could be a good gateway in. Um, I'm obviously a big believer that working with the body has to be done in recovery because that is the deepest brain in the human brain. That's where we're most prone to the freeze, to the shutdown parts of trauma. Um, and words can't get there. So we really have to learn how to work with the body. Um, and that is just so much I could say about that in a variety of ways that can be done. Um, and then for other people, it is more of the, the cognitive types of things like, uh, writing, uh, but even writing can take on a more creative quality to it. Uh, Self-knowledge, learning about trauma, learning that this idea that it's not that I'm a freak or I'm defective, but there's literally something going on with my brain. And I think a lot of these, um, you know, the balance part could be important because I've also worked with some people who are so overeducated about trauma and recovery. And I always say they're like the client I would trust to run my group because they know the factual information of recovery so well, but mm -hmm. it's not really clicked at the body heart level. Um, for some people, it is spiritual practice that, that really is, is that gateway uh, for them, whether that come more in a higher power 12-step container, a healthier religious experience, uh, yoga, meditation, all of these may be gateways, um, and expressive arts, which is another big passion point of mind, dancing, music, uh, creative writing, filmmaking, even there's some possibilities there. And I am an enthusiast in the idea of all of the above. Okay. I know even as I'm speaking to you about these different layers and strata, um, it has not been one thing that has worked for me. And I don't think I've ever met a client where it's been that one magic thing that has worked for them because feeling safe enough and look, teaching your body that danger has passed, or if danger comes again, I can protect myself. I can learn something about this. That's hard work. That's nothing that one instant thing is going to, to you know, <laughs> reset the brain. Right. That, uh, it really does take a variety of approaches. So I'd love to hear more about your journey with addiction and how, especially the last little while, you've been getting into more movement expressive arts. And could, could you tell us what it is that you're doing and how you got yeah. it? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you my, my qualifying story here in a bit of a nutshell. So okay. um, my official sober date is July 8th, 2002. Um, I, so I got sober reasonably young. I was about 23 and I was 21 when I knew something better be done or this, this was getting very bad very quickly. So I did what any good addict does and I moved to Europe. Uh, I grew up in Ohio and uh, my, my primary traumatic childhood experiences were bullying and we'll just leave it as the blanket family dysfunction of you know, so many possible layers that, that happened there. And school, especially in elementary school was definitely not much better, especially because I felt 
like this weird kid who was literally born in the wrong era. Like I liked old musicals while people were doing 80s music and now I'm an adult and I like 80s music. So like it's just, I always feel like I'm about 30 years behind. Um, so I, I guess my first addiction that really took hold was a lot of the overachieving. So when I was in high school, I knew I needed to do something to make myself different and special. So I had enough intelligence. I, I muddled through and was in every possible academic club and was, you know, championship speech and debate person, uh, valedictorian, all that good stuff. And then as soon as I hit college and had a little bit of independence, I started questioning a lot of what I grew up with, especially a lot of the religious toxicity that ran through some of my traumatic experiences. And it was like a whole nother world opened up. But as I started doing that, another thing that opened up in this world was pretty excessive drinking and drug use. And I <laughs> it, it, it was proportional to a lot of the pain I was experiencing, especially as I started asking questions and feeling like I was somehow really lost in life. So uh, I did manage to finish college, although I was struggling by the end. Um, and that was interesting for me that I had finally started experiencing academic consequences because I hid behind those for a while. Like, hey, I'm a good student. You know, what? what's the problem? Um, so my family is of Croatian descent, and I followed the Civil War very closely in the former Yugoslavia in the early 90s. So this was about 2000 that I graduated from college, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life or who I was or anything like that. Um, a lot of my family forces told me things because I knew I needed some kind of help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of family messaging I was getting were things like, well, you just need to go back to church and repent and be saved again, and that will cure you. Um, and on the other side, I was getting a message like, you're too smart to be an alcoholic, like, or you're too smart to do those drugs, you know, can't you just drink, things like that. <laughs> so right, right. I, I, did, I, was, I, and I didn't really even know how to access things like AA or treatment or any that was not even on my radar. So I ran away to Europe, I packed a backpack and ran to Europe. I had spent some, some summers there and so I wasn't going totally blind. And at the time it was a bit of a geographic cure. I mean, I'll admit that it was get me 8,000 miles away from everybody and I'll be fine and I could just live this charmed life. Um, but a really interesting thing ended up happening. I met my first recovery sponsor there. Uh, she had a dual role for me. She was a bit of a mentor and a sponsor. And the only thing I really had to kind of some therapeutic intervention at the time. And my first exposure to anything recovery was going to a meeting and translating for her. So mm. it wasn't a 12 step meeting per se. It was like a county meeting that was a, like a council on alcoholism because she was an American woman who um, moved there in her retirement and was trying to get some treatment and, and advocacy started there for recovery. And so, yeah, I translated this meeting for her and things just made a lot of sense. And even talking to her, I liked her and there was something very familiar about her. So I started asking her a lot of questions about my family's patterns with alcohol and addiction. Um, still not really connecting the dots for me. And then a couple um, uh, fruits of my misbehavior manifested later that summer, uh, which led me to go to her and say, hey, I think I have an issue with this too. Um, can I talk to you about it? And we spent, I remember that one day just in deep conversation for about three hours. And at the end of it, she said to me, you know, this is good news. And I'm like, <laughs> what about this is good, eh? <laughs> and how is this good news? Yeah. And she said, you know, it's good news. She goes, to me, you're an alcoholic addict. And what makes that good news is we know what to do about it. There's there's a course of action forward. And talking about the healing power of validation, which I spoke to earlier, nobody had really ever validated addiction as being, a, you know, call it like a disease, an illness, something that could be treated. Because I know there's a lot of controversy now about disease or call it something else. Uh, but for me, I was raised in a very moral model household where it was like you either, I, mean, I told you how <laughs> I was handled when I said I needed help. Yes. So having grown up in that kind of culture, I found you know, the disease model that she presented me with, the illness model, very empowering. I know some people find it disempowering to have it labeled as such, but for me, it really signaled you can do something about it. There's treatment here um, available. and 
it, it was one of the freest moments of my life hearing somebody explain what made it an illness so clearly, so beautifully. And that really started my journey. And it was not all smooth sailing. That first year I was in complete rebellion mode about, you know, thinking I needed treatment and help versus no, I'm okay. And I, 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 it was still that issue of problematic relationships I was engaging in and, and, and all of that. But after about a year or so of struggle, you know, there's that great axiom that once you've had a little bit of recovery, it ruins your drinking. Um, <laughs> that was definitely me. That was definitely me. And it reached a point where it was two days after my 23rd birthday and I felt like I was ready to die. And I hadn't even drank that much in the last couple months. It was just, I felt so tired trying to fight what I was and what I needed to do. So I went back to Janet, that, that sponsor, mentor, friend of mine. And I, I told her the hardest words I think any addicted person ever has to say, which is, you were right. <laughs> I was wrong. And I started following directions. And on one hand, that's when everything changed. Uh, it, it really was as simple as following a lot of directions and instruction. And on the other hand, every year of my recovery has come with some major challenge. So it's not like that was the end of the story happily ever after. And one of those challenges for me became when I started working on my professional internship a couple of years into my recovery. Um, she sent me back to do my master's degree. I was kind of kicking and screaming because I didn't think I would enjoy it. I hated psychology as an undergrad. My background is English, performing arts, history, the humanities, more that side of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, she says, you'll like it. Like you, you've worked here long enough with the kids with um, kind of seeing how war affects people. I, I think you'll really like counseling. And she was exactly right. Yet that first semester of internship, I found myself being triggered so badly not so much by people I was working with, but how I saw the system treating people. And it was a lot of those same invalidating patterns that just caused a lot of my grief and distress. And I had a colleague do a bit of an intervention on me and he said, you're going to need to get some more help or you won't last a minute in this field. And one of my protests was I didn't know what more help there was to be had because I had quite a bit of kind of traditional talk therapy at that point I knew every slogan and every recovery axiom and what I should be thinking doing inventorying all that good stuff uh, and, and I, I didn't want to drink I didn't want to use yet like in a lot of ways I still wanted to die I my mental health wasn't you know in good stead so I was given a card for another therapist who practiced near me and the person referring her said go see Janet she does all the weird stuff it's another Janet. So I've, I've had two very healing Janets in my life. So they said, go see Janet Thornton. She does all the weird stuff. Weird and stuff. So, yeah. And so I went to her and that's when I learned about things like meditation. That's when I received EMDR therapy, uh, eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, which I now teach and write about. And it's really been the big transformative treatment of my life, not just my personal life, but my professional life. And yeah, those early exposures to EMDR meditation guided imagery then got me interested in yoga uh, and cultivating a lot of my own mindfulness practice. And it really struck me as, wow, this is what's really been missing. Just so much more of the embodied, because I have a lot of the expressive piece already, being a singer songwriter, liking to write, liking the drawing. And I realized that even teaching kids English in Bosnia, that expressive arts will do it more than a worksheet or more than a textbook. Uh, so yeah, Janet's work really helped me. Janet Thornton's work helped me get into the embodiment and I developed a yoga practice soon after that and really loved it. Um, I had danced my whole life as a little kid. Uh, something I share in my book on dancing mindfulness is being a five-year-old kid in some of those dysfunctional traumatic patterns I talked about and going into the basement. And I remember very clearly I had a Mickey Mouse record player. And I would put records on and just kind of dance and act out my own stories in my head. And it was just, dance had always been a way for me to cope. And I took a lot of formal dance as a kid. Um, I was a Slavic folk dancer. I did ballet and jazz as part of, I would also figure skated as part of that training. 
Um, but part of why I struggled with calling myself a dancer is I was never the best kid in the class. I never had a prayer of doing anything professionally with it. It was just something I enjoyed. And so as an adult in recovery, I was really looking for a way to dance that didn't really have an achievement mindset to it. Uh, Cause I tried a couple of those Zumba fitness classes and it was the sense of if I wasn't keeping up with the steps, I felt like I was failing in some way. And I did ballroom for a while, which I enjoyed, but I, I never really had a life partner that liked that kind of dancing. So um, mm. I started going on a lot of yoga and meditation retreats. Uh, and it was at the Kripalu School in Massachusetts that I discovered this larger genre called conscious dance, which is basically the free form dance I had discovered as a kid in my basement. Uh, yeah, as being a yeah. thing and it's like wow there are classes where people do this all together just just kind of have this kind of spontaneous some people know it as a static dance mm -hmm. movement so I took some trainings and a few dance modalities of that nature but then fundamentally was kind of challenged to develop my own thing with it because I'd had a lot of ideas about using dance for trauma recovery uh, or some of the conscious ecstatic forms not really being trauma informed enough, uh, right. and 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 coming up with a model that could be workable in both the community and a clinical setting. And mindfulness had had also become a truly major part of my recovery by that point. And for me, dance and expressive arts were avenues by which I practiced mindfulness. Uh, I was already connecting those dots intuitively, so when it came time for me to really design a class and start designing some workshops. It was very natural for me to call it Dancing Mindfulness. And I remember the night going on Google thinking somebody had to have come up with this name and right. nobody had. So yeah, yeah. yeah here, here we are. And, yeah. and it really, I describe Dancing Mindfulness at this point as it's a practice. It's a practice that you can do personally or in a group. If, if you're practicing with others, you can dance together mindfully. Uh, the book I wrote in 2015 was really cultivated for people who may never be able to access a class. So it's how do you cultivate a dance mindfulness practice on a personal level? Mm -hmm. And we really are now a community of facilitators and enthusiasts who believe that mindfulness, although sitting still is an important part of it and can be an important part of it, that mindfulness can be practiced in any human activity. And for those of us who really embrace embodiment and expression, dance is the most natural way to practice mindfulness. Um, we always say we dance to be present with what life is bringing us, not dancing to escape it in any way. So right. I don't know how much of a nutshell that was, but that's my story, at least, <laughs> at least in brief. Well, that's great. You know, I have uh, somebody that I work with that does ballroom dancing. Um, and it's so essential for her nervous system mm -hmm. to dance and it's creative and it's authentic you you have to be connected you have to trust the partner that you're with yeah there's so much about it that's wonderful yep yeah yeah, yeah I, I learned a lot of stuff in ballroom uh, yep. when I took it that already linked recovery themes and yeah we even have a local gentleman right now who's a Vietnam veteran that is just this advocate for how ballroom dance helped him recover with his PTSD so right marvelous stuff yeah well and then there's dancing classrooms and mm -hmm. and that was very tra trauma focused too yeah yep. so what would be the difference uh, or a few differences between a regular ecstatic dance program and dancing mindfulness in terms of trauma how is that more trauma informed sure so if you're coming to a group dancing mindfulness class all of our facilitators are trained at very least in doing a thorough opening statement mm -hmm. which we inform people of things connected to physical safety which could be something as simple as take care of your feet through the whole practice so if you're on a hardwood floor make sure you're not wearing socks that are too slidey. Or if you are, just be mindful of it. Be mindful of things like long pant length or if there are physical hazards in the room. We also talk about the safety precaution of you can close your eyes or leave them open. For many people, what overwhelms them or makes them a little too claustrophobic is um, closing eyes. And sometimes facilitators in yoga or conscious or static dance will promote that. It's the sense of like going deep within, which it, can 
but you have to look at some of the risk involved. And so something we really try to do is promote a conscious choice at every juncture. And part of uh, conscious dance does lend itself to that because it is very free form, uh, but we really want people to know that. Uh, another thing we try to promote too is if you really feel you need to sit for your practice, that's fine. We did a dancing mindfulness video back in 2013 and one of our practitioners due to a physical disability sat the whole time and she danced with her hands, with her head, with her upper body. She did what she was able to. And that's very common in a dancing mindfulness class. So we also talk about that too in our op opening statement that opting out is always an option. And that goes for if you are feeling physically or emotionally at an edge to do that, that there's no pressure to keep up. And we also do a little bit of an orientation in our opening just on defining mindfulness. So what, is, what does mindfulness mean to you? And we find that if people become more mindful about how they're moving, um, there's an automatic tendency to not push yourself, but to go where the practice is taking you physically, emotionally. And even one of my early collaborators noticed that. Uh, she said that's why she struggled with some other forms of conscious dance, but was able to do dancing mindfulness because there was just such a mindful component brought into it. And it really was validated that if you're there doing this the whole time and then coming to stillness, uh, it's, it's cool. And so much of dancing mindfulness has now been embraced by the expressive arts therapy community. And we teach it now as part of a larger expressive arts training, if people want to do that. And so another little snippet that we've uh, taken into our classes is having things like art materials and writing materials available on the side. Because some people will find that even sitting out and watching others dance can potentially bring up some stuff. And if it is, maybe taking your hand to the page will help you sort some of that. Or writing or, or drawing or coloring is a way that may feel safer for you to connect with the larger communal experience that's going on. Another thing we're really careful to do is not to promote forced intimacy with things like touching or grouping or uh, rubbing up against each other. And, and the thing is, I'm not totally opposed to that if it's a working group where you know the dancers, you know the people, and there's a couple groupings I'll teach that are about introducing yourself to each other, but touch is always made optional. Mm. Um, and like we're shown little gestures, if you don't wanna be touched, maybe bring your hand to your chest and you won't be judged for it, that you always have that right to not receive touch. Because some of the uneasinesses I experienced even as a student in some conscious dance was, all right, let's start dancing with each other or showing your moves to each other or rubbing up against each other and, my, my bells and whistles went off a little too much with, with right. some of that. So we've really tried to avoid that in dancing mindfulness. So we're looking at connection within and connection yes. with others in a group of people with trauma who don't trust others and have been hurt at the hands of others. Right. It's very delicate. Yes. Yeah. And, if, and if facilitators we have found have their personal practice and are aware of that, they can automatically begin to create a space that is safe enough. And something I teach too, you know, talking about the safe versus safe enough, is as a facilitator, please don't ever tell people they're in a safe place. Because even to say something like, Lynn, you're in a safe place here. I'm still telling you what to feel. Right. Um, versus I, I'm doing my best to create a safe as possible space here. You decide. Mm -hmm. you decide if you feel safe enough to jump your toe in and engage in some of this or if you need to back off and observe it for a while so yeah something I say throughout my trauma-informed facilitation is don't you know try to even avoid using lines like dancing will make you feel fabulous because maybe you're really struggling with it with, right. with body consciousness and all of that so yeah. to me so much of being trauma-informed and trauma-focused is about watching your language and a huge aspect of that is don't tell people what they should or shouldn't be feeling physically or emotionally use a lot of language of invitation and let people decide for themselves right right yeah so so important and that safe enough can can go off the rails pretty quickly mm -hmm. if you feel judged or if you feel pressured yep. or anything like that yep yeah so in the recovery world Mm -hmm. I've noticed the last few years there seems to be more of a somatic focusing 
Mm -hmm. um, people are starting to go, okay, maybe talk therapy isn't everything. Mm -hmm. EMDR, I've, I've done a, a several rounds of EMDR and it's been very helpful for me too. Mm -hmm. um, so can you maybe talk a little bit about that? So what is it that happens in, in, in EMDR in particular? Sure. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It is a horrible, horribly clunky name that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around. But I think when I'm asked to explain EMDR, it's easiest to talk a little bit about the story of how it was founded, how it was discovered. So in the late 80s, there was a psychologist based in the Bay Area named Francine Shapiro, who was a cancer survivor. And that's a significant part of the story because as a result of treating her cancer, she became very interested in mind-body medicine. She studied meditation with Stephen Levine, took yoga workshops, did a lot with visualization, um, really looking at this mind-body connection. So she became used to, as she has said in several interviews, experimenting on herself. Like if I do this with my mental processes, how does it help my body feel? If I move my body in this way, how does it help my mental processes? And as the story goes, she was taking this kind of now fabled walk in the park. Uh, I, I really believe she took several walks and kind of cultivated this over several walks, the more I've read the story. But as she was walking, she noticed some distressing thoughts that would plague her. And normally the type of thoughts you'd have to engage, but they were coming up more spontaneously. And as she allowed herself to do that, she noticed to sit with the thoughts, be with the thoughts, she noticed her eyes began moving back and forth. So very diagonally, very rapidly. And as one story goes, she sat along a bench and just let the eyes continue to track. There was some water in front of her, some light on some water, some trees. And the more and more she did that with her eyes, the less and less distress she felt. And so later, um, she gathered a group of her friends and colleagues and basically said, let's see what happens when we do this deliberately. So she had them bring up some disturbing thoughts, memories, sensations, and apply this dual attention stimulus back and forth, bilateral stimulation, it's, it's, it has been called. Um, and a desensitization effect was observed. People noticed that they didn't feel as much charge around the memories. So she developed a protocol, she had it researched, um, which really explored this idea of these back and forth eye movements as some kind of mechanism for helping us process in a way that didn't require words. So of course it was written off as crazy new agey hippie science by or barely science by a lot of people in the establishment right away. But it did gather the attention, gain the attention of enough pretty prominent people early on who were already growing frustrated themselves with talk therapy figuring there has to be something else because if people if just talking about the trauma helped, then we'd have a bunch of healed people and that wasn't happening. Um, and so maybe it was this thing with the eye movements that was helping us get to what we now see as the limbic brain and the reptilian brain, the part that, that doesn't have anything to do with words. Uh, so you don't need eye movements anymore to do it. In some early experimentations, they found you could put headphones on and hear tones going back and forth, and it does a very similar thing. You could tap back and forth on your legs or across your chest like this, and we have machines that do similar things. Uh, so it really is any dual attention stimulus now, left hemisphere to right hemisphere, that seems to cause a greater sense of integration in these layers of our brain I've been talking about, that reptile brain, which is more the, the body free stuff, the limbic brain, which is more the feeling, the pain, the pleasure, that's where our panic responses can get, excuse me, stuck. And then our more rational brain, which is designed to hold memories more functionally long-term, uh, and but we're somehow cut off from it when things haven't been processed. So. It really is fabulous treatment. It's been very well researched at this point. It's the most, the second, well, it's one of two of the most researched therapies for PTSD in this day and age. The World Health Organization, SAMHSA, has have validated it. Um, the World Health Organization recommendations, uh, and a lot of other clinical bodies have too, uh, but the World Health Organization recommendations really excite me because um, there's so much about EMDR that, has made a difference on the global stage because it, it really isn't about words. <laughs> it's about using this embodied process to, to help us get to this place in, in the brain. 
And I think a lot of what Shapiro did do was tap into an innate healing mechanism, which is moving the body back and forth. And in Native American and indigenous cultures, drumming and dancing were the two healing prescriptions when warriors returned from battle. Uh, a lot of people who run or jog or swim or walk, when I explain EMDR to them, it makes good sense, especially if they have experienced some of those activities as being very healing. Um, like whenever I have a runner who says something like, oh gosh, I do all my emotional work when I run. I'm sure this EMDR makes a lot of sense. Right. Uh, that's often a nice connection. So I think another part of EMDR that, because the eye movements, the bilateral is, tends to be what it's known for, but even how a lot of the questions are asked in EMDR are quite brilliant. It's questions like, what are you noticing now? Mm -hmm. as opposed to what are you thinking, feeling, seeing. It's just what's there. It's, it's very open-ended. And another line we use in EMDR a lot is just notice that. Go with that. You don't have to put words to it. It's really about sitting with or being with an experience and seeing what unfolds next. And that's a lot of where Shapiro definitely drew on her meditation training in developing some of that language. And that's part of the work that Steve and I are really doing right now is encouraging even EMDR therapists to return back to some of that soul, to some of the roots of, of where you know, the crucible in which she developed EMDR, which was this container of mindfulness, mind-body medicine, uh, because there's just a lot of great connections to be had there. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very effective. And it's starting to be used a lot more. Um, I That makes me happy to hear that mm -hmm. others are validating that because, yeah, it's it's what entered my life at that fragile period in my own recovery. And mm -hmm. I had such an overwhelmingly positive experience with it. I knew immediately I had to get trained and be able to offer that to my clients and um, others I served. And it's just been, I've seen it make such a difference for others. If people would just give it a chance, that's often a lot of the roadblock with it because there is this bizarreness around it. And a lot of the establishment has kind of, bucked it because of that but i think once people really give it a chance and it's done by a well-trained person um, a lot of cool things can happen mm -hmm. well and it seems like um there's such a recognition that talk therapy is one element and there has to be a lot of other yeah. support so dancing and creative arts and yeah EMDR, all of these things are there's there's such a, a nice holistic yeah. program that you can do a lot of them when we do trainings now in EMDR, it, on the first day when we have everybody do their go around, so many people, if not everybody, will share, what drew me to this training is I need something else because right. everything I've been trained in in graduate school, the talk stuff, it's just not working with these clients who have been so deeply wounded mm -hmm. that, that, that talking or thinking it through it just isn't cutting it. All the step work in the world isn't getting through it. So... Uh, yeah, a lot of people find EMDR because they do need that something else. Well, we know that intuitively as well. Like someone will say, you know, you need to drink more water. You need to get more sleep. Yeah. You need to eat healthy or whatever. It's like, we all know what to do basically. Right. And then how do we actually. Do yeah. They say it's that like, you know, 18 inch journey or whatever from the head <laughs> to the heart. And that yeah. was totally my experience when, when I came in as a client that I knew everything I should be doing. Right yet it wasn't connecting, it wasn't linking up. And that's the journey for so many of my clients. I know I made that joke about, think of the people who know recovery so well, you would trust them to run your group. Because right. you know you've had those kind of clients. If you're a clinician, they, they know the bubble dot answers. They know right. what thinking errors to challenge, but it just hasn't shifted at that level of the heart and the body so i you know i know we've talked a lot about the kind of three layers of the brain the mind body spirit stuff you know for for people who are not clinicians another more expressive arts metaphor i'll make or clinicians who struggle with the brain stuff is think of the wizard of oz mm -hmm. so there's the cowardly lion which i think is a good representative force for that survival brain, that, that reptilian brain, that really deep brain that, that gets deeply afraid and frozen. There's the tin man, which is the heart, the emotions, the middle brain. Mm -hmm. And then the scarecrow, which is that more rational brain. Um, Dorothy needed all three to get home. 
Right. Dorothy needed all three and a little bit of spiritual intervention to realize she had the answers in her all along. So, uh, yeah, I, I often don't resonate so much with the technical brain lectures, but remember I was listening to one one day and I said to my friend, oh, it, this was years ago, I'm like, it's like the Wizard of Oz. It's like the lion, the, 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 yeah. the, um, the man and the yeah. scarecrow, yeah. like courage, heart, and brain. And, and you know what we call, it's all the brain, but more the more rational brain. Right. And we really do need to have healing that addresses all three. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone who's in recovery, who's struggling to stay in recovery, who's kind of feeling flat about it, they're, they just haven't come into that kind of life that they feel that they could. What are some things that you would suggest for people? Hmm. It's a tough question because part of my approach is things are so individualized when it comes to healing. It's, it's really hard to know. I would say if somebody has a more traditional 12 step view on stuff and you're not quite finding it, uh, keep trying other groups and other people because, you know, I'm someone who has never really felt at home at the majority of meetings that are out there, but thank God I have felt at home and just enough and have met just enough people Mm -hmm. who have really kind of gotten me and resonated with me to, to validate. So it's like, where, where are you getting that, that validation? I also want to tell people there's no one quick fix solution. I know a lot of our marketers like to sell that, like try this thing, try that thing and, and you'll be healed. You'll be cured and all of this. But as I shared with those, those brains that we have, there's three of them. So if, if one area is really suffering, um, address that, but also be mindful to address the others as well. So if you are somebody who's had so much therapy and you have so much knowledge, but something is missing really spiritual or, or something's really lacking at the body level, maybe experiment with different forms of conscious types of exercise you can try. Because I think exercise can be found in a lot of ways. Um, and some people don't even like that word exercise, but just movement. Um, so for me, it has been jujitsu, it's been dance, it's been yoga. I've done both grounded yoga and aerial yoga. And I find something in all of it that, that has a lesson to teach me. And I've heard people say, like, the first time I swam sober, I just felt that sensation in my body that I knew things were going to be okay. Um, one recovery slogan I like, because I'm not a fan of a lot of the slogans, is uh, don't leave before the miracle happens. Um, mm. keep, keep trying. You know, there are so many paths to be tried. And it, it will just take, it may take that one to get you interested enough before you start exploring some of the others. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I hope that's helpful to your listeners that don't bank on one thing, one person being the answer that it really does take a combination of healing salves for, for any of us to heal and, and keep that explorer's heart. And I think suffering can prompt a lot of us into taking that journey. Um, it took me to Europe, but that's where it got me here to where I am today. You may not have to get on a plane and go across the world, but hopefully you'll be led to some place that you start making the connections. how would you define recovery for yourself now or for someone like obviously your life is very different now compared to what it was before recovery mm -hmm. so what are some of the ways that you would describe that yeah for me sort of like radical recovery deep recovery is is a conscious commitment to keep working on yourself it's a conscious commitment to keep exploring a more adaptive life because i do believe and this opinion is controversial in some circles, both within addiction and trauma, that trauma and addiction can cause irreparable damage to the brain. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's, it's a death sentence. It, it means you can learn ways. It's like a person, I use this example all the time, who's born with one leg. It's in my TEDx talk. Healing may never mean getting that leg back. 
but what you can do is learn the resources to adapt and thrive in life. So for a person with born with one leg, it may be getting a prosthetic, using your emotional, spiritual, artistic support resources, getting some other kind of help with outlook and attitude that if we're shown how, um, even if there is irreparable damage, we, we can continually work on ourselves and come to this place of adapting and healing and thriving. I have never seen my recovery as a thing where I was broken and I'm fixed. Oh, mm -hmm. It's um, something stunted my growth <laughs> and I have to continue to take a lot of measures to make sure that I continue growing. I need sunlight, I need water, I need rest, I need good soil. Um, and yeah, that, that has come at a cost in certain areas of my life. I mean, there have been relationships I, and friendships I've lost because people have kind of resented what I've needed to do to take care of myself. But that fundamentally is recovery for me. So is there anything you'd like to close with? It could be a quote. It could be something you feel like we haven't gone into enough yet. Yeah, I saw in your email you sent me the quote, uh, you know, what's a quote you like? And I'm, I, I'm a quote person. I, I really do like quotes um, more than slogans. But yeah, quote, quotes are fabulous. And the one I share whenever I'm asked for a recovery quote that I really like and guide, it's actually the one that Francine Shapiro shares in her work, in her EMDR writings, um, which is John Paul Sartre. I can never pronounce the French beautifully, but Sartre, um, freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. Freedom is what you do with what has been done to you. I love that. When I read that mm. all those years ago, it was just the sense of ease and calm that came over me. And that's why I really, it, it could be a valid criticism at times that people who say they have an illness with, with their addiction and their trauma, they're just pulling the PTSD card or pulling the addiction card. And it's like, no, because right. the, 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 then there's work to be done. Um, I think a, of another version of that, which I share in Trauma on the 12 Steps is something my Janet, my sponsor Janet said was, Jamie, after everything you've been through, it's no wonder you became alcoholic. What are you going to do about it now? Right. So the first part was the validation, which as we've talked about is so important. And then it was the challenge. We need both. Right. So whether it's Janet's version of that idea or the freedom is what you, you do with what has been done to you. I hope uh, your listeners can maybe draw some inspiration from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, even if there has been irreparable damage to the mm -hmm. brain and the nervous system, it doesn't mean that life is over, that we can't right. copy there's still so much that we can do, yep. especially now that we know so much more about trauma yep. and how to heal it. We can still thrive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you let our listeners know how to get a hold of you? Sure. So I, easiest way is if you see my name popping up there, just go to jamiemarich.com, J-A-M-I-E-M-A-R-I-C-H.com. That links to all of my websites for all of my projects, like Dancing Mindfulness, the EMDR trainings, the books. Uh, a good, real user-friendly resource, though, that I sponsor, this may be easier to remember than my name, is traumamadesimple.com. Uh, anything for free that I've written is cataloged on there, blogs, online articles, and also all my YouTube videos are cataloged on that website too. So I designed it to be a client-friendly resource that hopefully clinicians can use as well. So that's traumamadesimple.com. Okay, that's great. I'll have those titles on the great. on the video too so people Appreciate can... Appreciate it. Good. Well, thank you so much. It's it was my fun. pleasure. I... Go to killabycenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit to see the upcoming speakers, and to register to watch the interviews free.